Tonight uh, is a um, heavy occasion for, for us because many of us just came from a funeral, from a Leviah, um, from Mordechai Miller from Gateshead. And uh, you're probably not aware of how much of his teaching is the, behind the material that, you, that we have studied together in this, uh, in this forum. Now, I personally was privileged to learn a certain amount directly from him and an uh, immeasurable amount indirectly. Let me try and share with you this evening um, a basic idea that runs through the whole Torah, finds its origin in the parasha we read last week of Adam and the sin, Adam Rishon and the sin that he perpetrated, and continues in this week's parasha, Noah and the flood, the generation that, whose demerits brought that flood upon the world, the subsequent generation that, um, the subsequent generation that uh, built the tower, which was a expression of overarching pride, it brought their dispersion across the face of the world. Let me share with you some of the things that Rabbi Miller taught us about these. Uh, about these, um, these issues that he brought down and explained in his, in his uh, unmatchable style and depth from his great teacher, Rabbi Desla. You know, the problem is that we are, if we want to take a sober moment like this, to reflect on what it is that we are and where we should be going. So the problem that faces us, if we want to be what we should be, we want to be as good as we should be, so we have to deal with the world of evil, we have to deal with the forces of negativity, the forces of evil that, that surround us, that confront us, and they have their origin, obviously, in the, the sin, the damage that was... That was brought upon the world by his mismanagement of the ordeal that he, that he faced. Now, what was this, what, what exactly was the nature of this ordeal that the first man, man and woman, faced? What exactly was it, and what are its ramifications and the ripples that move on from that center of time and space into our generation? And if we identify the problem clearly, then we can pick our way, we have a chance at least of picking our way through it in a... And ho- hoping we can hope then to reach some sort of successful conclusion. So let's backtrack to that moment in time and try to understand what exactly what exactly happened. What I'm trying to share with you, you'll find in the first in the first two pieces in Rabbi Miller's book. Uh, a lot of this and I, a few words of explanation, perhaps, or just a broader <coughs> discussion. But essentially, essentially, you'll you'll find it there. You know, it takes a tremendous effort for us to achieve objectivity in this domain. Because when we talk about the, neg- the forces of negativity that pull us down, the problem is that those forces are, they speak with your voice. They speak with your voice. There's not an objective thing that you face ex- externally. Now, Desla explains, and as Rob Miller so ably explains, it brings down and explicates, makes clear to us, is that the voice of evil or the voice of the temptation to fall into the world of evil, the, in the original design of man, that voice was external. That voice was external. The way the, the way the sages put it is that your own lower self, your own lower self has an automatic mastery over you. The way the sages put it in their beautiful way is that first, your own lower energy, the, 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 the side of you, the lower side, the side of you that tries to kill you, that side starts out as a passerby starts out as a passerby in the street. The natural process is that he walks past and he begs at the door. And before you know it, you've invited him in, and he's not a passerby, but he's a guest. And as soon as he becomes a guest and you don't notice, he becomes the master of the house. And if you're lucky, you're a guest. Most times you're not a guest. You're begging at the door. And not long after that, you are a vagabond in the street. In other words, your inner being becomes inhabited by exactly the part of you that... Harder of Desla explained this very in an in a, in a unforgettable piece. He says that the original design of man 
place the voice of neg- negativity external to man's consciousness, man and woman's consciousness. And that the voice of positivity was the voice of self. That means the voice of selfhood, that means my identification of myself was my goodness. Me, that means my consciousness and who I am, was, was indistinguishable from my motivation to goodness or to serve Hashem, to be part of Him, to be one with Him. That's who I, that's who I was. That's who man was. And there was a voice, voice externally speaking and saying, <coughs> fall. Right? The, this is the Torah. The Torah puts this in the description. The Torah's description of this is that the voice is spoken from the mouth of the serpent. That means the snake appears as an external object of reality. Man himself, man and woman, experience their own cleaving to Hashem. That means they have total clarity. Their motivation is only for what is good and right. And is abs- with absolute clarity. And the voice that tends them to do w- which is that which is harmful, with all its blandishments and all its appeal, is a voice that speaks externally. And that's why it's portrayed in the Torah as being an animal that is separate and other than man and his consciousness. But after the sin, and it's hard to go into details, but the sin w- involves much more than the eating of a fruit. The eating of a fruit is really a way of saying... I have to try and think this through a bit more, in more depth. But the eating of a fruit really means the becoming one. When you eat something, you absorb it and it becomes you. <coughs> now it becomes you. That means the nutrient, that means the, the nourishment of the food that you eat, bonds itself in and builds what it is that you are. It's not something that your body uses. It, it, it is that which your body consists of. That's part of the idea. I mean, the sources explain in great detail that, the, that the, what, what happened between Eve and the serpent was actually an intimate relationship. It was not the temptation to eat a fruit. It was, that's only one way of saying it. It was, a, it was a personal, intimate relationship so that there becomes a mingling of their essence and that damage is now vested in us. But the way of Desla puts it is that the result is that the voice of negativity is now the one who inhabits you and your consciousness. And if you're lucky, the voice of positivity speaks, if at all, speaks from the outside. I mean, the way you can experience that, anyone who doubts it, if you doubt it, if you're insulted and humiliated to, to, at the suggestion that your consciousness itself is your lower self and your motivation to that which is sensuous and that which is, which is low and childish and lazy and physical and your voice of conscience is external to you, it's not really you, humiliating though that may be, but when you think about it in real terms, you'll see that's how you think. You only have to ask yourself, what does your inner voice say when you find yourself tempted by something low? What is your voice? What, 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 is, what are the words that form? In, you know, most of, most of us, unfortunately, think in words. We've lost the skill of thinking of things as they are. We think in terms of, of words. We have an inner conversation with ourselves. In fact, not only do we speak to ourselves, we don't even take the time to listen. <laughs> most of us... The way our inner dialogue goes is you say something and before you've even heard it, you run around to try to answer it and defend yourself against this thing before you've even heard what it is. That's how, that's how our... But when that conversation gets going, how does it sound? Let's say you're faced with something that is sensuous and illicit. So that inner voice says, hmm, I'd like to do that. I'd like to try that. I'd like to taste that. That's first person. That's me. And then the voice of conscience, if you're lucky, if it does speak... How does the voice of conscience, how does your conscience speak to you? How does your good side speak to you? Second person, you know you shouldn't do that. You know you shouldn't do that. Speaking from far off stage. That very, very distant, very, very distant voice. In fact, it's usually a very, very quiet and meek voice right, that says, that's how it is, that's how it is. It could be a simple thing like trying to diet. You ever tried dieting? No one in present company ever obviously tried that. Have you ever tried dieting and you sit with a creamy, multi layered, you know, whatever it is in front of you? Your uh, desire to eat that thing is undoubtedly phrased in the first person. Right? That looks good to me. I would like to taste that. That's how you, that's how you deal with it. And then you say, when you hear the voice that phrases the resolution that you made to diet, right, the voice says, but you know you said you wouldn't do that. You know you shouldn't do that. It's a you addressing... Yeah, and that's a very humiliating true fact of human consciousness is that that force of evil is now internal and identified with you. You call it me. And the voice of conscience, the higher, the call to a higher mode 
is that which speaks to you from outside. That is the reversal that we have wrought in our own consciousness by the experience of tasting and relating to intimately and deeply that which we, of course, should not. Let's try and go a little bit further and study this a bit more deeply. One or two of these themes I think we've mentioned before on various occasions. Let's see if we can try and put them into context and follow them through. What is the nature of this problem? What exactly is the nature of this problem? How do you do that? How do you succumb to that which, is not, which you know is wrong? Let, let's do the painful job of looking into that inner depth of consciousness that leads you to do that which you know at the time you shouldn't be doing. We're not talking here about making mistakes, about things that you accidentally do and discover later are wrong. No, we're not talking about that. Not most, most of us don't have that problem. Most of us have the problem that we know it's wrong while we're doing it. And you know that you've done this before. Most of the things that we do wrong, we've done before wrong. One of the features of the Yetzirah is that it does very, finds very difficult to come up with Chidushim, you know, new temptations. One of the greatest humiliations of your own negativity is that it's, you know, you've fallen for it before. Right? It's like married couples who argue. Married couples who argue are arguing always about the same thing. They're the same words. 35 years of marriage, they say the same. You, can, you know exactly how that conversation is going to go. It started the same and it's going to end the same. And it's exactly the same. You think they come up with the creativity of arguing about something new. <laughs> but they don't. Right? And that's how you, in your marriage with your own inner being, you're always having the same conversation. He doesn't say do it. He says do it again. That's what he says. <laughs> do it again. And after you've done it again, he says do it again. That, that, that's, that's the real humiliation. And you find yourself suddenly having done it, even though you said you wouldn't do it. And it's been again and again and again. That's usually the problem. How does that happen? How does it happen? How do you sit there facing an option? You don't understand this deeply. If you want to have armament against it, you have to understand it. Try and explain later in Sashem that that's what Musa is. If there's one thing Rabbi Miller taught us, it is to understand these things in depth. Musa does not mean, Musa meaning Jewish character building, Jewish personality training, right? That, that which is called Musa, which means, Musar means the, the, inner, the work of inner rebuke, of in, inner correction, self-correction. People think it means, you know, exercises in self-denial and, and self-control. That's not the depth of what Musa is. The depth of Musa is a deep Torah understanding of these things. That, that's what it is. Of course it involves self, self-control exercises and, and, and practice. Of course it does. It's essential. But the source of it, the core of it, is a deep understanding. If that's, that's what they gave us, the gift they gave us with the Torah understanding of these things. It's how these things operate in depth. It's an acutely accurate insight into one's own, the character, the nature of man. It's from there that you begin. So let's do that. Let's do that painful job. What is it that happens at the crux of consciousness when you, when you sit facing something that you know that's wrong and you couldn't know it more clearly and you've done it before and you know how it brought you down and before you can even turn around, you've done it again. How does that happen? What does this mean? You know, the way the sages put it, even more perplexing, they say, Ein Adam over avera. A person has never sins. Elohim can unless nichnas boruch shtus. A, a spirit of insanity comes into you. That's how you sin. There's a moment of insanity. What does that mean? How? What, what kind of insanity? Insanity that leaves you blameless because there was a moment of, of involuntary insanity? What is voluntary insanity? What, what does this mean? Let's try and go as deeply as we can into this. And there's nothing more important, obviously, than this subject. Let's, let's understand. The tree of evil, right? again, again we, we take for granted in this discussion that we are thinking more advanced. We are on a more advanced plane here in this forum than a childlike or childish level. We're not seeing primitive childlike pictures right, of a man and a woman looking like we do today in a fruit of a tree. We're not trying to look a bit more deeply. I think we mentioned before that the axiom in Torah is that the simple meaning of the words is always what they appear to mean. You can never controvert the simple meaning. The pshat, the simple meaning, is always, is always exactly as it is pictured, <coughs> but beneath that are endless layers of depth. The deepest we call sod. Sod means the secret or the Kabbalistic level. And that takes a lifetime to study. When the, when the Torah says a simple thing like people walk through a desert or a man walked up a mountain, it means that. It means that. You can never pervert that meaning. But beneath that, it means much more. What, what, means, what is the meaning of a man walking up a mountain is what endless depth beneath it, which is under the surface of the physical picture of a person walking up a mountain. But the walking up the mountain is true as well. 
And the simple meaning is always that which meets the eye, and it always means that. But beneath that is an endless world, a world of endless depth, reaching into that which is unfathomable, and takes a lifetime to begin to get the smallest, faintest image of what that thing is. And that principle is true throughout the Torah, but it's, it's untrue in one area where it's reversed. And that is in the Pasha that we read last week. In the description of creation, the process is the opposite. Our sources tell us that when the Torah describes the creation of the world, and the events in that garden, what the Torah is talking about there openly is the Kabbalistic level. That's what it means at first blush, first glance. You want to know what it looked like physically? That's a lifetime of delving to get the faintest suggestion of what it must have looked like. Now, obviously, the beginning of the Torah, you're dealing with the nuclear energy, you're dealing with the genetics, you're dealing with the core of reality. You're dealing with the things that are in the deepest world. That's where it unfolds from. And therefore, the Torah there describes things as they are in their depth. What they looked like externally, you have to think about it. It takes a lot of thinking. So these, what the Torah is describing there is at the heart of what human existence is. What did it look like physically? Their lifetime to begin to... Can you picture what human beings looked like? They, their skin shone with light. And the light that shone from his heels, it says, after he was dead and someone he saw... That one of the Tanoim went into the Machpelah where Adam is buried. And he saw his body after death. And he was allowed to look only upon his heels. And the light that shone from his heels was brighter than the sun. So imagine, after he sinned, and after he died, the light that remains shining from his heels, and the heels are always the lowest part of the human being. The heels are the part that were never alive in the first place. Right? Because the heel is dead. Yeah, he's dead even when you're born. There's a question of how long it takes to spread. So he looked upon his heels, that part of the human being which is dead after death. And the light that shone from his heels was greater than the sun. Can you imagine what he looked like in his fullness when he was created? No way you can picture that. So understand, they're very deep things. But that tree that he was confronted with, or those two trees, the tree of life, the Etzadas, and the Etzadas, Tevurah, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what is the nature of that, those trees, or let's, let's begin with the one that's problematic, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What exactly is that? What does it mean? And let's try to descend into that as far as we can, into that <coughs> beginning of this problem of human history to understand where we stand. The first issue is, there are many ways to approach it, the first issue is this. It's called the Eitz Hadas Tov Vera. Not Eitz Hadas Tov Vera, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. First of all, what does Das mean? Knowledge always means intimate bonding, joining into one. Now, that's what knowledge means. So the literal translation of that verse is, of that phrase in the Torah is, Eitz Hadas Tov Vera, the tree of the intimate bonding of good and bad. The first problem one should, one should have, the first question one should ask about that verse is why does it mention good? We know that that tree represented the temptation to do that which is forbidden, right? In other words, do not eat from the fruit of that tree. That was the one commandment that Adam was given. Don't eat the fruit of that tree. Because it's evil. That will bring evil, the breakdown of evil, into the world. So surely it should have been called the tree of evil, or the tree of the knowledge of evil. Again, it's a basic question that should have bothered anyone who reads the verses plainly. Why does it say it was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? What's the good doing there? Can you, see the, oh, can you see the problem? Anyone? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> but the literal meaning, and I said, take the, the, read the words accurately. The literal meaning of the verse is the knowledge, meaning the bonding of good and bad. The tree is not the tree of evil. That's not the problem. It's the admixture of good and evil. That's the problem. It's the confusion between good and evil. That tree, when you eat from that tree, you don't become bad, you become confused. Do you know what that tree is called in the Kabbalistic writings? Ilana de Sveka, the tree of doubt. The tree of doubt, that's what it's called. Although the word doubt never appears in the Torah, you know that? The word doubt in Hebrew, safek, and vadai, meaning certain, those two opposite polarities of doubt and certainty, those are not biblical words. You know that? They were coined by the sages. The original source of language, the Torah, does not have words for those things. But the sages come along and they say that that tree is called Ilana de Sveka, the tree of doubt. What does this mean exactly? What does this mean? We've, we've looked at one angle of this subject before. Let's, 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 let's see what we can... What, what can we draw out of this? You see, if that had been the tree of evil, and man had made contact with that tree, and absorbed some of that into his own being, evil would have manifested in such an offensive fashion that you would have had nothing to do with it. Evil, evil, that's the opposite of reality. That would have been so offensive. That the only way that it became part of man is not because it is because it presents itself as good. 
the tree of the knowledge of good and evil means the tree of confusion. After eating from that tree, there's nothing in the world that is bad that doesn't have some justification in it, some appeal to it, some rationalizable justification. And there's nothing bad in the world that doesn't have some, and there's nothing good that doesn't have some bad. All elements of the world are now an admixture. There's nothing that is absolutely, extremely purified as either good or bad. Human opportunities, human experiences, temptations, ordeals, they are all comprised of situations of conflicting reality. That's the problem. Nobody would fall for evil if it exposed itself as evil. The way of evil appeals to you is that it rational. By the time it's finished with you, it's convinced you that it's a mitzvah. Doesn't it? By the time you finish with it, this is absolutely a big mitzvah what you're about to do. <coughs> no question. That's what it does. There's a confusion. There's a moment of insanity that it manages to perpetrate. But let's try and study this. First of all, one beautiful insight into this is, you know, what does it mean when there's a word? John, just try and look at this for a moment. What does it mean when there's a word that does not appear in the Torah? I think we've discussed this in other contexts before. But very briefly, what does it mean when there's a word that does not appear in the Torah? You know, all things in the world are sourced in the Torah. Everything that exists in the world is located in root in the Torah. We discussed this idea many times that the Torah projects itself into reality. The Torah is the blueprint or the genes, if you like. It's the film through which the infinite light is shone, and that projects itself on the screen of reality. There can, not, there can be nothing on the screen that is not originating on the film. And there can be nothing on the film that does not reflect itself in the world. Everything in the Torah finds expression in the world. That's why it's there. And everything in the world can only be there if it had its origin in Torah, because that's reality. Right? The one is an accurate reflection. You need to study either one. You don't need to study both. If you study the Torah well, you know the whole world. That's what Shlomo Melech did. He studied the Torah and knew the whole world. Right? He planted crops in Jerusalem that don't grow there. You know that? One says he planted crops in Yerushalayim that don't grow in that climate. Why? Because looking into the Torah, he knew which veins, arteries, nerves of reality penetrate from Yerushalayim to that part of the world that they support. Yerushalayim is the center of the world. And on that meridian, he planted the crops that grow in that place. And they grew here. Because he could discern where those lines of force were. He knew the world in its depth from the Torah. Avram Avinu, who lived before the Torah was given, figured out the Torah from the world. He looked into the world, studied it deeply, and he started keeping the mitzvahs. He voluntarily kept all the mitzvot. How did he know the mitzvahs? How did he figure out these? How did he figure out even the details of the rabbinic mitzvahs? And so the world. The one is a projection of the other. And therefore you study what's on the screen, you know what's in the film. Or you study what's in the film, you know what's on the screen. Furthermore, every detail on the film is a detail in the world. To put it more specifically, every word in the Torah is an object in the world. And that's why, in Hebrew, the word for a word and the word for an object are the same word. Unlike all other languages on earth, as far as I'm aware, the word for a word in Hebrew is davar, and the word for an object is davar. In Hebrew, when any two concepts are named by the same word, it means they're the same thing. And the meaning here is that every object in the world is a word of the Torah. Every object or phenomenon or experience, every thing, as we say in English, in the world, is a word of the Torah that has projected itself into that aspect of reality and now manifests as that thing. And therefore it's a word in the Torah and it's a thing in the world. Not like the world thinks that a word is a verbal sound which is a, 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 connotes a certain object. In Torah it's not like that. In Torah the word is the source of that object. And if you understand the word fully, you will know the object or experience fully. And if you know the object fully, you will know the name. That's why Adam named the creatures. He was taken around the world and he named them. How did he name them? He didn't append names to them. He perceived their names. How did he do that? Because he perceived the Dabvar accurately at pure eyes. So he saw every object in the world accurately and its name was manifest. And therefore... Any word in the Torah is projecting itself into the reality in the world that corresponds to that word. That's a wonderful idea. It's a basic technique. It's a basic tool of Torah study. We need to be going to it further on another occasion. But what we will want to extract from that this evening is, what is the meaning of a word that does not appear in the Torah? What happens when you have a concept in the world that has no word in the Torah? That imagine you come across something that looks very real to you. And you search throughout the whole of Tanakh, all of scriptural writing, and there's no word for that thing. 
you have a very clear clue here that the thing you're experiencing is an illusion. If the Torah doesn't name it, it was never created. Yes, it was never, it's not in the genes. It's damage that's being done to the body that was not coded for by the genes. The genes. Somebody came along and painted it up on the screen of reality, but it's not in the film. After all, if you go back and check the film, and you do not find that image on the film, and it's visible on the screen, somebody has distorted, somebody has come between the film and the screen. Somebody has painted that image up on the screen, but it's not traceable in the source. It's an imposition on reality, which is not a reflection of its source. What are words like that? There are a number of classes of words like this. Just mention, to try and illustrate this, uh, the word for nature, for example. The word teva, the Hebrew word nature, never appears in time. There's no Hebrew word like that, you know that? There's no scriptural word, teva, nature. The root of that word appears in Torah. It means to drown, or it means, it's the root of the word for drowning in Hebrew, it is also the root of the word for an embossed image. A matbea in Hebrew is a coin that has a surface image, an embossed image. Right? Those, the roots exist, those and others. But the word nature, meaning what we call, when we look out at the world, the world of our perception shows us, we perceive a world that is self-maintaining, self-generating, self-maintaining sequence of cause and effect. One cause leads to an effect, that is the cause of the next effect. And we even put rules and laws of physics and chemistry, etc. That's how we see the world. The Torah doesn't have it. We call that nature. In fact, we get so carried away with it, we call it nature with a capital N sometimes. You know, when they have a, you ever read these atheistic books that deal with the wonders of the created world? The wonders, the stupendous wonders of subatomic physics or of the biological world? Mind, unfathomable, unfathomable depths of, of, of craft in some aspect of the world, you read what the textbooks say, they say, nature has so designed it, that's the way they write. And when they get carried away, they write of the capital N, nature. And when they really get completely carried away, they say, mother nature. <laughs> that's what they say. Mother nature has so designed it that <coughs> they consider that to be a reality. They want to explain something, they say, nature is the, that's inherent in nature. But the Torah is no word for that, and the reason is there's no such thing. The Torah concept is that the world is nothing other than an emanation of His presence. So there we have the principle, Einoid Milvadu, there's nothing besides Him. The world of our perception is an emanation of that reality. Einoid Milvadu, there's nothing besides Him. The Zohar says, Les us upon him, you know. there's, no, there's no chink of reality that's free of His, the emanation of His being. What would be if the Torah had a word for nature? Can you see the problem? If there were a word in the Torah called nature then that would project itself into the fabric of reality as a thing called nature. Right? But there is no such thing. We who perceive, we come along, and we perceive a world that we call the natural world. There's no question we perceive it. We don't see the emanation of divine reality. So legitimately for us, we coin a name. There's nothing wrong with that. We coin a name for our perception, but the Torah, which is reality, doesn't do that. Another beautiful example in fact, this example was conveyed to me by Rabbi Miller himself. On one conversation I was privileged to have with him, he pointed out to me that Rabbi Dessler used to say that in Hebrew, almost, almost unimaginably, there's no word for having. You know that in Hebrew you can't say, I have. You know that in secular cultures, in secular notions, people are judged by what they possess. What I attach to me, right, whether it's possessions, wealth, usually people as well, those who are acquired by me, right, are the way I measure my, my status, my self-esteem, and certainly my external, the external respect that I command in the world, is judged, unfortunately, all too often, by what I attach to me as my possessions. That, that's what's commonly called wealth in the secular notion. In Hebrew, you just can't say that. In Hebrew, you cannot say, I have something. The only way you can express... Hebrew only has words for, his, for essential intrinsic existence. Now, you can only talk about the real existence of a thing. In Hebrew, if you want to say, I have, you have to say, yesh li. What that literally means is, it exists in real terms, in relationship to me. All you can talk about is its natural, genuine existence, and express its relationship to you. But you can't say, I have. Just can't say that. Yeah? Now, one word like this, that the Torah does not have, is the word for doubt. The word suffolk, meaning doubt, and of course the word vada, you know, again, you know, if you can't have doubt, you can't have, 
Do you know the word certainty is only relevant in a world of doubt? I mean, that should be apparent. Is that, is that correct? The word certainty, vadai, is only relevant in a world where doubt is possible. If you can't be in doubt about something, you can't be certain. You're only sure of something that you could... The truth is that we are so confused about this. We are so confused about reality that we say we're sure exactly when we're not sure. He said, I'm sure I saw him yesterday. <laughs> what you mean is you're not at all sure. If you really were clearly sure, you'd simply say you saw him. <coughs> that our concept of certainty is, is simply an expression of the denial of the doubt that might have been. And therefore the Torah doesn't express this spectrum at all. Huh? Why? It's remarkable. It's people who speak Hebrew are not aware of this. because such a natural word. Safek, right? The word for a doubt. It's such a... But if you look in the original source of language and concepts, and therefore objects, there's no word for that. And the reason is because nothing in the world was created doubtfully. Nothing was created doubtfully. Show me something in the fabric of existence that is, you know, so, sort of maybe there. Yeah. Things were either created or they weren't. Nothing vague about the world. Doubt is your problem. That is our problem of perception. That's the, so we, human beings, come along and we name our subjective confusion. But he never created anything doubtfully. Is this clear? He created the possibility, and that's the tree. He created a tree that can mix good and bad so you can be confused. And that's why it's called the tree of doubt. It's the tree of the admixture or the bonding of good and bad. That's what he created. But he never created, there's nothing in the world that exists doubtfully. Everything is crystal clear in the world. The problem is how you look at that thing. And therefore, we name this experience on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we say, Havadai Shmo, we call, we call Hashem's name Vadai. Strange name. We talk about Hashem, we talk about God, and we say, your name is certainty. What we mean is, on the elevated occasions of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we elevate ourselves, we wish to see reality clearly. We're trying to get ourselves into the mode of seeing the source of reality clearly and knowing it firsthand. So we say... Your name is certainty. But it's human work that we're doing. That's the work of Emana, the work of faith becoming knowledge. The Torah doesn't have a word like that. Why the sages coined the word Safek? It's also interesting. Safek in Hebrew is Gematria of Amalek. It's the same numerical value as Amalek, that nation that comes to destroy the Jewish ideal. Amalek, incidentally, spells Amal Kof, the work of the monkey. Because that is the closest thing to the human that apes the human form, but is not. But, and that confuses the human into thinking that he's a monkey. What, what generation in the world's history has... Yeah, this generation has fallen into that. Not only that, they're not even ashamed to say it. Not even ashamed to say it anymore. Not only do they believe that they're monkeys, they're not even ashamed to say it. You know, it's my humble opinion, I don't want to get too much of the subject, but if you think about the people who've moved human society m- most in the last century, the last couple of centuries, last, this in the modern age, of the people who've shaped the modern notions or the consciousness of this generation, probably they were Freud, Einstein, Marx, and Darwin, probably. Why were three Jewish and one not? Why were three of them Jewish and one not? I nice thought that. Huh? I, would, I would imagine... My personal feeling is probably because the, th- the first three who brought great notions of they brought notions of human the tremendous depth of understanding, right or wrong, of e- e- even on a messianic scale of a social order that would be who knows what. But the theory that a human being is an accidental monkey, what you would say such a thing? <laughs> what you would say such a thing? If a Jew, what? if a Jew thought that he he he. He'd announce that, go public. He'd go public saying... (laughs) (laughs) Jews are driven. (laughs) Jews are driven by a desire to to be serious about the world. That means to perceive a depth about the world. To do something, to make a change, to do something. What Jew would stand up and make a public statement that I hereby declare that I'm an accidental gorilla? (laughs) You know... uh, you effectively close all discussion. Once you've announced that, there's the end of discussion. You're an accidental version of what was once an amoeba, and was then, you know, a chicken. <laughs> anyway, you got sidetracked there, but... <laughs> The issue is that the issue is that 
they, apart from that, the word safek, actually the root of the word in Hebrew means saf. Saf means the border of something. Experience of doubt, the effect of, the, the consequence of being in doubt is that you stand always on the border. Is that right? When you, when you have to undertake an experience and you don't know which one to undertake, so you stand on the edge of both experiences. Right? Like in Yeshiva world, they say about the young fellow in Yeshiva can't decide whether he's going to put on Rashi's tefillin or Rabbeinu Tam's tefillin. So while he stands there in doubt, he debates the question, doesn't put on either. Right? That's the issue. Doubt is a paralyzing, while you hold in doubt, you don't do either of the options. You remain, as it were, on the south, the shore, the edge, the border of the experience. Right? That's, that's inherent in the concept. But the title of the word doesn't appear. And therefore, what we're talking about here is a world of human confusion. The eating of the fruit of that tree brought into existence the admixture of good and evil. And confusion was the result. Not evil, but confusion so that no longer can you discern where the good ends and the bad begins. That is the problem. And you see the results immediately. You see that the result of eating that fruit is that Adam became confused. I mean, what is the very next incident that the Torah describes? After he eats the fruit of the tree, what happens? He hides. I think we pointed this out before. He hides under the t- trees in the garden. Who's he hiding from? <coughs> He's hiding from the one who sees through the trees. He hasn't forgotten that. He hasn't forgotten that. Moments before he spoke to Hashem, right? as no other human being ever has since, face to face, his head reached into worlds that are supernal. The Midrashim say the angels try to worship him. He knew Hashem personally like we can't begin to imagine. And now he's trying, he knows that he sees, he not only sees through the world, he is the world. And yet he's trying to hide. Talk about confusion. Talk about confusion. You know, had he forgotten about Hashem, he wouldn't have bothered to hide. You have to understand the confusion here. That means he hasn't forgotten who Hashem is. That's why he's hiding. And yet he thinks he can hide. Talk about voluntary insanity. Can you imagine the pain of a human being who had that clear consciousness before that and now finds himself in a situation of, of having to tell himself that, that he can hide from the one you can't hide from? There's only thing, one thing more painful than that. And that's Hashem's response. What's he doing? You have to understand this. He's hiding under the trees, saying to himself, I'm hiding from the one who can see through the trees, but I'm telling myself that he can't see me. What must have been his inner depth? What must have been the core of his emotion at that time? He must have been crying out in his inner neshama for Hashem to, you know, just schlep me out of this and bring me back to you. That's what he must have been longing for in the depth of his being. And how does Hashem respond? How does Hashem respond? He comes into the garden and he says, Ayeka, where are you? Where are you? I don't see. That's how you want to play the game? You want to set up the rules? That's how you want to set up the rules? You want to play the game? You want to pretend that I don't see you? Even though you know I can? Where are you? <laughs> Ayeka, the word where are you, is the same word as Eicha, which means lamentations, the beginning of the Megillah of destruction. That, that two nuances of the same word. So, Ayeka, where are you? Can you imagine? That must have gone through him like a knife. Imagine, he's... That's what it means. Hashem tzilcha, Hashem is your shadow. He, he responds the way... And what happens? He crawls out from under the bushes, can you imagine, to face Hashem, and Hashem says, Did you eat? <laughs> Did you eat from... Th- I don't know. <laughs> I don't see. It's well known that the word Hamin, Did you eat from the tree? The question is the word Haman. Not Haman, that agent of Amalek, which you mentioned before, that is the agency of doubt. Do you understand what's happening? You see the depth of this? The agency of doubt in the world is the nation called Amalek. That's the embodiment of this doubt. Yeah, so Haman, who represents them, which is why he wants to wipe out the Jewish people, we'll speak about it more at Purim time maybe, he wants to wipe out the Jewish people. That negative force, which is Haman, is phrased in the word Hamin. Amalek represents doubt in the world. Where's Hashem? Maybe yes, maybe not. Maybe there's a God, maybe not. Maybe there's a God who created the world and now he's doing other things. That's what they say. That's what they say. That's one form of atheism. Is that, of course, there was a God. The world couldn't have done itself. But he's left. You see, it's a miserable place. You see, it's a miserable place. It's a failure, this place. You see, it's not generating what it's supposed to generate. That's for sure. It never has. From the first day, it failed. So he's left. He left us to undivide, not involved anymore. Right? That's the force of, that's what Haman represents in the world. So the first time his name appears in the Torah, Hamin Ha'etz, God's question. Did you, meaning, I don't know. 
If Hashem says He doesn't know and doesn't see, He's allowing that gap in the world of human doubt. It becomes then, then it becomes real. This illusion. And from that moment on, the world changes. I mean, there are a lot of details to it. One of the details is that excretion begins. Excretion, the eating of the fruit of the tree. The eating from the fruit of the tree begins the process of food becoming offensive. That means, just like he took into his mind the confusion between good and bad, he takes into his body that which is nourishing and must be absorbed, and that which is to be excreted and offensive. And the work of the body becomes to separate those two. The body must, must absorb and digest and become the nourishment and the nutrients, and it must then reveal as offensive the part that is to be excreted. Adam never did that before. The body in a state of perfection never had that offensive function. Remarkable thing. I mean, even... It's very hard to say these words. But when the Mashiach, in the Messianic revelation, when Hashem reveals Himself again in that purity which He once revealed to us before. You know what the verse says? Ani esbol Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? You can't say these words in English. Hashem says about Himself that when that day comes, I shall... One can't say the words in... in but I shall leave Myself in a revelation of clarity, and there shall be a, a divesting of, an excretion of, all the world of impurity. He says that about Himself. What happened to the Jewish people when they neared that perfection at Sinai? When the Jewish people got back to that level of perfection? So the Gemara says, excretion ceased. Their bodies no longer excreted. Why? They ate man. They ate manna. They ate again the food. That means they were on a level where their bodies were pure. Yet back to that pre-sin state almost. And therefore they were able to absorb food that is only to be absorbed. Do you know what the man was? Do you know what man, do you know what, you know what manna is? Do you know what man means in Hebrew? It means what is it? It was so high spiritually that it could not even be named. All they could call it is, what is it? Do you know, the, the deep sources say that man was crystallized shechina. It was divine presence crystallized into a... That's what they were eating. When you eat that, there's no excretion. There's no excretion. And who were their arch enemies in the desert? What philosophy did they come across in the desert that resented all evil? It's known as Baal Peor. You know what Baal Peor was? You know, these things are... Baal Peor was a cult of the worship of excretion. It was an idolatrous cult where the highest expression of their idolatry, of their, of their spirituality, was the process of excretion. Baal Peor. The Gemara says that, that, that a woman arrived there once. I mean, you have to understand these things. A woman arrived there once who had served every idolatrous cause in the world. She was trying to find spirituality, and she said, We find people like that. Too. Still popular. She, she experienced every idolatrous practice in the world. And when she came across this thing where people's worship was to excrete in the presence of this idol, she was so offended that she went and she performed her personal ablutions on top of this idol. And the Gemara says that the priests of this idol came up to her and they congratulated her. They said, never seen such consummate worship. <laughs> what, what were these people? Sick? Deranged? So it doesn't talk about people like that. You're talking about people who knew exactly what means the separation, but they were attached to the evil side. They were attached not to that which should be absorbed, having left behind. They knew all about the separation. And they attached themselves to the negativity. The Philistines, you know what they worship? The fly. The fly, you know that? They worship flies. Again, mentally unbalanced people. In their, in their temples, they, had a, they worship the fly. It has a name as well. <coughs> you know what a fly is? Flies attach themselves only to that which is rotting. Only to that which is offensive and rotting. Flies can't, they don't have, flies can only absorb that which is already liquefying in putrefaction. It's a deep thing. Their spirituality represents a separation between good and bad. They attach themselves to the bad. That was the process. And therefore, the sin, what happened in the case of Adam or in Adam, was eating from the fruit of a tree, which was the bringing into the world of an admixture, confusing mixture of good and bad. 
Now the world is not a bad place, it's a confused place. That's the problem. And this theme continues. I mean, it's an endless theme, of course. It runs throughout human history. The, uh, let's, let's continue the theme. Yeah, let's take it a little bit further. What was the result? Let's just think it through, see how far it goes. What was the result? So they were banished from the garden. They were banished from the garden, the place of purity and perfection. They were banished, exiled from the garden. So why didn't they turn around and go back in? Why didn't they turn around? You know, the Midrashim say, the Yalkut says, that he had a chance. He had a chance. You know what Hashem said? Let's exile him from the garden. Pen Yishlach, lest he set forth his hand and take from the tree of the fruit, the fruit of the tree of life, uh, and live forever. You know what some sources say? Hashem was revealing to him that they had the opportunity to do it. He had the opportunity to do it. Yeah. When Hashem says, you have to listen carefully to the words. Let's remove him from the garden before he stretches forth his hand and takes from the fruit of the tree of life. What do you hear in those words? Simple meaning, let's get him out of here before he does it. Hidden meaning, man, you have the power to do it. But he felt he felt to take the opportunity. Matthew says he met Cain later. You know, Adam met his own son. And his face was looking. Adam said to him, what are you? He himself had been. So Cain said, I did shiver. I repented. And I made a compromise. I worked it out. And Adam, it says, started beating himself in the face. And saying to himself, I never knew. Moses was standing on the mountain. And a and sin took place among the Jewish people. And Hashem said to him, Hear me, man. leave me. I'm going to destroy them. Those are the words. Hashem said to Moshe, the great leader who, who represented the Jewish people. God said to him, Hashem said to him, Leave me, I'm going to destroy them. And Moshe clung. He held on. And he argued and he saved the Jewish people. you know where he drew the courage for that? Where did he draw the courage? Because he heard, when, Hashem, when he heard Hashem saying the words, leave me, he understood that he had a hold. He had a hold. There was a clue there. And he held. Don't do those things without permission. Invitation, you have to hear it. So when he missed that opportunity and he was exiled, why didn't he turn around and go back in? They were standing there, right? Beaten and cursed. So it says, because Hashem put guards at the gate. These are the spiritual guardians of the gate of the garden. Two angels. You know, angels, kruvi, means beings with the faces of children. Yemma says, kruvi means karavia. Ravia means a child in Aramaic. And they held in their hands this lava cherva misapeches, the blade of the flashing sword, or the turning blade, or the turning and flashing blade of the sword, sword being an agency of destruction. And therefore, you can't get back into the garden. Just think for a moment. What are these angels? You know, these are very deep things. What are these kruvim that stand guarding the gate? And what is this blade of a sword that turns? What is it? Let's try and dissect this in layers. The first layer is this. The sources that talk about it say that the flashing blade of the sword is the confusion of perception. The way your perception works and the reason you can never achieve clarity, then the reason you can never find your way back to that garden that you once inhabited, is because every time you think about the same thing, you think about it differently. That means the way human consciousness works is that you go through certain experiences in life that give you clarity. It's inevitable. He gives you that opportunity. You have a tremendous flash of clarity. Tremendous flash of clarity that leads you to a clear ideology, a clear ideal, idealization. And the next day you wake up, you can't believe that you saw it that way the day before. You not, not only do you disagree, you can't believe that you saw it that way. And if you wait one more day, you won't believe on the third day that you saw it that way on the second day. And after that's happened to you a few times, you know there's no more hope for you. Because your perception, that's what it happens. You were clear then. Why are, you not, why are you confused now? All you can do at best is remember that you were once clear. But you try to recapture that clarity, it's impossible. The Rambam says that this experience is like standing on a plane on a stormy night. It's an unforgettable image. And you stand there lashed by the rain and beaten back by the wind. In a howling storm, you have no idea where you are. And suddenly at the moment of greatest confusion is a flash of lightning. And that millisecond of lightning shows you the road clearer than day. But as soon as you perceive it, it becomes dark again. And the rest is hour after hour of moving along that road, beaten back by the storm and on memory alone. Memory alone. That's most of life is like that. Is having the courage to move along with the memory because you know you were once clear about this, even though it doesn't seem that way now. 
Now, Lapian used to say it's like going on a river on a dark night. And as the little boat floats around a bend, you see one candle on the bank. And it's a clarity. And as you watch it recede in the distance, you go around the next bend, it's dark again, who knows how long. That's life. That's a flashing blade of the sword, is that as soon as you perceive something with clarity, you see it differently the next day. Until you no longer trust your perception of clarity in the first place. There's another layer of interpretation. Rav Miller explains this again most beautifully. You know what happened after what happened after this experience? What happened after this? What happened after man was banished and humankind spread across the face of the world? They were wiped out. They gave into a temptation. They gave into the temptation. They became sensuously perverted, and the world is flooded, destroyed. Water is chesed. Water is the energy of chesed. Chesed is sensual immorality. It's the same thing. It means saying yes and not being able to say no. Saying yes in unlimited fashion. So the world was destroyed by a pouring out of water that knows no limits. Water is a blessing, not a curse. And sensual involvement is a blessing, not a curse. But if you don't know where to say no, then it's destruction of the world. When the rain falls, it's a blessing. But if it doesn't know where to stop, then it's a flood. And that's what happened. The world was wiped out. And subsequently, after the world was re-established, and one man and his family, they floated upon the face of those waters, which always means, yeah, riding above that dimension, which is why in that ark there was no contact between male and female. And they repopulated the world when they came out. And what happened to that world? The people went wrong again. They tried to build a tower. There's not time now to go into the details. Iru Migdal, a city and a tower. But the tower that was designed to reach into the outer reaches of reality. What was the ideology behind the tower? Nase Ito Milchama. Let's go and do war, make war with him. They knew who he was. Nimrod, the king. Nimrod, the king of that generation. Huh? Nimrod means to rebel. Merit, because he rebelled against Hashem. They, weren't, they didn't forget who Hashem was. They rebelled against him. By the way, you know when the Mashiach is here, the nations of the world will attack Israel against Hashem and the Mashiach. It says, Al Hashem val Mashiach. They will not try and attack us as a human nation. <laughs> they will attack us as representatives of the one true divine reality with the Messianic revelation. They will come knowingly and clearly against that reality. A chutzpah? The chutzpah. That's what these people did. That's what they did. Let's climb up and make war with him. Take control of the world. That's what they said. How could they think such a thing? What's the depth of this? It's all description in the deeper sources. Exactly how, what techniques they intended to use in order to... Uh, discussion. That's what they did. And they were dispersed. They were destroyed. They dispersed across the world. They lost their language of prophecy. In a very brief nutshell, in a very brief overview... As Ramada puts it, what were the sin of these two generations? What were the sins of these two generations? The generation of the flood gave into sensual perversion. But that's where they that's what we call Taiva. Taiva means the lust dimension. The physical the bringing down because of the energies that speak from the bottom, from the lower self, from the physicality. And the generation of the dispersion, Dora Palaga, Palaga, right? Those who were dispersed and destroyed that way, they gave in to the opposite sin of pride. Not lust in physicality. They wanted pride. Can you imagine? They wanted to go and conquer the battle with the creator of the world and wrest control of the world from him and take it over. The, fla- the blade of the flashing sword, you know what those two faces are? They're the flashing ordeal of Taiva and Gaiva. That's what the Balai Musa explained. Taiva means lust and sensuality. You fall into one of the two. Either you give in and you, you yield to your lower temptations, yeah, and you become animalistic, or you overcome them and become refined and prideful because you managed. It's one way or the other. It's one way or the other. Our minister says that the faces of the angels represent both those things. <coughs> the two, the purity of the face of a child, and the lack of control and the the lusts of youth. Two possibilities. But that's what they did. How did they do that? Because they became confused. They became confused. How do you decide you're going to do battle with Hashem? Take control of the world. Because at that moment of ordeal, you allow yourself to become insane. That's what happens. To become insane. We're talking about a generation that was destroyed in the flood 
knowing the reality of the world clearly. They were, they were around, they saw the first human beings who ever walked the earth. People lived hundreds of years then. The flood occurred in the year 1656, 1656 years after the creation. Now, Adam himself lived 930 years. So they saw people who saw him. The, the, his sons were alive. They, they were right back there at the beginning of creation. They decided to rebel. And the next generation of the flood, you know what they said? The, 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 the people who built the tower? You know what some sources say? The city and the tower? You know what they're trying to build? Yerushalayim and the base of Mikdash. City and tower. There's sources for that in Tanakh. Yerushalayim and the base of Mikdash. The place of connection with the spiritual world. So they could get up there for the wrong reasons. You know what they said they were building? They said, you know what happens over here? One, every 1,656 years, a flood occurs. That's the natural cycle. That's what they said. He did it as a lesson. No, it's a natural cycle. So it's a natural cataclysm. Let's start building this thing that will support the higher world so it cannot collapse and flood us again. This is a theory. Kind of confused? How do you become confused? Because you allow yourself to. You know the experience of, experience of temptation? You sit there in your clear consciousness. Let's see if we can put words to it. What is a temptation? How does it lead you into what you shouldn't do? You sit there knowing exactly what's happening to you. Total mastery, absolute clarity. While the options appeal to you. Isn't that what happens? If you say it's not, you're lying. The one option appeals to you and says, you know how good this will taste? You know how good this will feel? And then you say, but look, it's ridiculous. Ridiculous, it's wrong. It's wrong, I don't need that. It's childish. A ten-year-old wouldn't fall for that. I've done that before and I felt disgusted with myself after it. I've, it's never worked. It's always left me feeling disgusted. It's clear. Then it appeals to you again. Tries to convince you. And you see it clearly. You, have, you couldn't see it more clearly. You've got experience of it. Not even the unknown. If you were watching someone else go through this process, is there any chance you would... What would you think of somebody who faced this thing that they clearly decided not to do? That is destructive, that they'll hate themselves for, they feel disgusted immediately. Within two seconds of beginning, they feel disgusted. But it tastes sweet, it looks good. But you know it won't. Have you ever tried to eat a jar of honey? You know how much honey you can eat before you become... Very little. So what happens, you taste a little and it's good. And then you tell yourself that you... You'll tell yourself that you'll stop before it gets too much. And before you know it, you've long passed the point of nauseating. <laughs> but you know it. You know it so clearly. How do you do that? What happens is at a certain moment, you allow one of those two things in. And the only way you can allow it in is to become insane. That's called Ruachstus. You allow into your consciousness a total confusion, absolute inhuman non-existence. <laughs> and in that moment of blankness and blindness and non-existence, it's in. And two seconds later, you realize that you are that one disgusting experience when the smoke clears and the dust settles. But you would never let it in if you didn't allow yourself to become insane. That's what happens. What's the origin of that insanity? What's the ori- Isn't that what happens? What happens? What happens in that moment of... How does it happen? One moment before you see them clearly. You couldn't see them all clearly. This is right, this is wrong. You know it's wrong. Clear. You know you won't do it. And a second later, you've done it? What happened? Because you short-circuited the logic. What happens is you allowed a moment of complete insanity. You, you allowed that in. And it's your responsibility. That's, you made the choice. It's not, it's not not your fault. This is yes, your fault. That's who you are is that control. And you lost it. You lose it. You drop it. You would never allow that thing in if you didn't allow that insanity to occur. You would never do it. What same person would do that thing? What's the origin of this insanity? When he ate from the fruit of that tree. He took in a good and a bad that became so mixed with each other that you can't tell them apart anymore. And he brought into his inner existence, into the depth of his existence, not external anymore. He brought in the ability to drive yourself insane for as long as it takes. (laughs) That's what happened. What's the correction for this thing? What's the correction? Abraham Avinu, right? Abraham. Abraham Avinu. He stood against the whole world. This Nimrod, who rebelled against Hashem and started building the tower. 
And the whole humankind represented that effort. And he stood against them. You know, the, one of the great latter-day commentaries says that the furnace in which the bricks were fired, you know, when they built that city and tower, they fired bricks. There's a deep mean, meaning to these. But uh, bricks, let's say. They fired bricks in a furnace, and they were precious, these bricks, because they were the building blocks of this tower that would take them to their ideal. He says it was the same furnace into which Abraham Abinu was thrown when he stood firm and refused to be part of that effort. Nimrod threw him into a furnace, from which he miraculously survived. It was the same, do you understand what's happening here? The same furnace that built the bricks to make that effort is the same furnace that led them to kill the one man who stood against that. The same thing. But he was prepared to do that. He stood against the world. He was prepared to think clearly. Ah, oh, the whole world's gone crazy. The whole world, in case you hadn't noticed. The whole world's crazy. To the point of ridiculous, brutal, wanton murder, suicide. Total insanity. It's prepared to think clearly. It's one man against the world. They make it appear sane because they all do it. I'm impressed by that. And that's it, that's it, that's a resolution. It's not at first level the work of trying to be good. It's the first level trying to be sane and intelligent and know what's good and what's bad and sort them out clearly and refuse to allow insanity to step in. That's what we're looking for. Torah learning is an effort in learning to think clearly. Now, before people ever learned Musa, before people ever made a practice of learning self-control techniques and character refinement, they learned Torah. Torah is a clarity of thinking. The Rambam says that before good and evil entered human consciousness, there was only truth and falsehood, that's all. There was no good and bad. It was either true or false. True means it's real, and false means it's not there. That's all. But after the sin, true and false became good and bad, and they became confused. And the first effort, if you want to achieve something, you want to get someplace, the first effort is not to try to be good, or to try to discipline yourself and self-control. All those techniques, obviously, which are essential, the first effort is just to become clear. If the whole world is crazy, that doesn't make a difference. It's to learn to discern clearly, put in their place, excrete that which is not, and absorb, yes, that which is. And to define bad and good as far as possible as true and false, as existence and reality and non-existence. If there was one person who taught us to do this in this generation, it must have been Rabbi Miller. In his unmatchable way, he taught us how to think clearly about these things. Apart from embodying the practice of these things tangibly. You know, it struck me today when I heard the news that, you know, the Gemara says that the fruit that Adam ate was wheat. The discussion in the Talmud, was it uh, grapes? What fruit was it? For, for sure it wasn't an apple, by the way. It wasn't an apple. Was it a grape? Because grapes... You understand what's going on here? Was it a grape? Why? Because grapes make wine, and wine makes confusion. Was it a fig, according to one opinion, the Gemara? Because they sowed fig leaves to cover themselves. That means that the agency of their shame became the agency of their saving themselves from shame. And the third opinion of the was wheat. <coughs> Dagan, wheat. Because when a child eats wheat, when a child's old enough to eat a... a, a statutory amount of, of wheat, he has the discerning ability to know who his father is. Most says he can say Abba. The baby can say Abba when he's old enough to eat. So, wheat yeah, is connected in the mystical notion with the ability to discern. To discern, <coughs> to say Abba doesn't only mean that a baby knows Abba. It means that you as a baby know Abba, the real Abba. That's what it means. And it struck me when I heard today the name Miller. You know what a Miller does? You know what is it to mill wheat? To separate the chaff. To separate that which is the... Like Asaph came to his father and he said to him, do you have to take Mysa from straw? <coughs> straw, which is, the, which is the outer casing of the wheat within. Now he was involved with that, with the outer part, not the good stuff within. The ability to discern those two things is what a Miller does. Rabbi Miller's name was Mordechai. Mordechai was the one who stood against Haman. Haman, the agent of Amalek, which is the force of doubt in the world, that tries to pretend to be human when it's not. The one who stood against him with utter clarity. The rest of the Jewish people decided to bow down. 
The only one who could stand up was somebody who was so pure. Mordechai knew that he was invincible because of his purity. He was able to drive Haman crazy. He drove him out of his canyon. He caused him to self-destruct. You have to, be, you have to be on the level to do that. Mordechai represents that name, that great Jew, was the one who represented clarity in a world of confusion. I'll finish with this. In the, in the Megillah of Esther, you know the whole Megillah of Esther is about Hashem's hiddenness. The name Esther means to hide. Hastir, astir, ponai. I shall hide my face on that day. The whole Megillah does not contain Hashem's name. Complete confusion. And the Jewish people misinterpreted every event. The Jewish people interpreted a certain event as requiring them to do a certain thing, to go to the king's party, and they reasoned that it would be kosher food and kosher wine, and if they didn't do it, there would be a decree of destruction against the Jewish people. There's a classic piece, Rav Dessel explains this in detail, Rav Rav Mill explained it to us. So beautifully. The Jewish people were so wrong, they couldn't have been more wrong. And their leader, the great Das Torah, the great Torah mind of the generation, Mordechai, said, you're wrong, and this will bring destruction upon us. And they said, it's patently obvious you're wrong. And they made a decision, they went against him, they went to the party, and that's when the whole decree of destruction was promulgated against the Jewish people. And ultimately, it was he who saved them. We learn from this what a Torah mind is. That looks to you one way, and it looks absolutely clear that it's that way. But beneath the surface, you don't have the eyes to see, and the consciousness to know, that you are confused. And the eyes of the Jewish people, which are the Torah sages, they see clearly. And Mordechai said, you can't see this, but this is a destruction. And long process of many years went by until it was revealed that their conduct was responsible for a decree of destruction. And this was what saved them. Anyway, this is our, this is our pain on this occasion. Right now, it's on his way to Eretz to be buried. That was a man from whom we transmitted to us, this generation who never knew Rabbi Desla, he transmitted his teachings to us, had an un- immeasurable influence on this generation, virtually every teacher of Torah in this generation has a measure of that wisdom that came down from the... Rabbi Miller was the... apart from his own personal greatness, he was the, his, his, perhaps the greatest element of his personality and his greatness was being that pure conduit for that particular brand of wisdom, which has as its center the ability to distinguish clarity. But not to live mindlessly and not to go through, not even to go through certain exercises of self-improvement that are mindless. But on the contrary, to descend into the eye of the storm. To, be able to understand exactly what the forces and energies are. To have the courage to face them, the clarity to dis- discern, to take them apart. But, and that is the beginning of the direction that we need to set up in our minds is to know what to absorb and what not to absorb. What needs to be absorbed is that which needs to be absorbed. And it's that ability to take incorrectly and take and exclude that from our consciousness and our minds and our lifestyles that should be excluded. That is that tool that will ultimately lead the pure child to be able to say Abba.